Hello, and welcome to Driving in Hydrocephalus. My name is Nicole, and I am your facilitator. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors for making this event possible. There will be ample time for question and answering um, at the end of the session. To ask any questions, please fill out the note card at your seat, and our greeter will come and pick them up. Does hydrocephalus have an impact and on one's ability to drive? Learn how to obtain a driving assessment to see if there is an impact on driving and why it would be important to have an assessment. Become more knowledgeable about the implications for particip participating in the driving assessment and what to expect. Participants will gain a better understanding of various types of adaptive equipment for individuals with a physical disability in conjunction with hydrocephalus. I'd like to introduce Aida Weber from Courage Kennedy Kenny Rehabilitation Institute, part of Alina Health in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay, so um, I like to walk around a little bit when I do my presentations. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me, okay? And I think everyone here has a packet now, right? And if you don't, I have some extra ones up here, okay? So um, I am an occupational therapist as well as a driving rehab specialist and a certified driving, um, oh, did I say that? I already said that, a licensed driving instructor, okay? Um, I am gonna tell you a little story, funny, ironic story that happened to me this morning as I was backing up out of my driveway, always thinking about all I had to do today and just meeting my friends for a quick run and um, thinking about all the, dri the driving presentations I had to do today. And I was backing up really slowly and I'm looking back at one mirror, but not necessarily the other. And then all of a sudden I hear a crack. And I look over to the right, I was like, oh my God, I just hit my side view mirror on the side of the garage. I'm like, great. <laughs> and so, yes, I do evaluate people every day to see if they have the ability to drive. And yes, I do make mistakes, too. I am normal, so, you know, I don't have a perfect driving record until today. <laughs> so, um, and another funny thing that happens, so I'm talking to my husband on the way to meet my friends, and a squirrel comes out of nowhere and then I hit the squirrel too. I'm like, great, maybe I should walk here today. <laughs> so um, just funny, ironic story that just happened to happen this morning. So a little bit about how I got into driving. So um, I'm an occupational therapist and when I was a student in OT school in South Carolina, I was um, sitting in the classroom and we had a speaker come in and she, was a driving rehab specialist as well as an OT. And she talked a lot about um, driving and uh, working with different clients with disabilities and, um, and how risky it is all the days that she works with these guys because she has to take them behind the wheel and sometimes they have some accidents and sometimes she has to use the brake and sometimes she has to grab the wheel when she does um, the driving assessments. And I kept thinking to myself, she's crazy. Why is she doing this? Why is she risking her life every day? And so 2016, here I am, and I'm doing the same thing. Um, so when I first started as an OT, I um, did the general OT type of thing. I worked in the hospitals. I worked in acute care. I worked in inpatient, outpatient. I've worked in um, a couple of centers you may have heard about in Atlanta, Shepherd Center. I work with spinal cord injuries a lot, as well as um, um, brain injuries. I've also worked at National Rehab Hospital in Washington, D.C. We moved here seven years ago because of my husband and um, did not like the winters here, but now I, I love it. it ha Minnesota has a lot to offer for an um, for individual. Um, so when I first moved here, I was doing some home health, and I said to myself, you know, I want to see what else is out there for OT. And so this opportunity just kind of jumped into my lap, and, um, and I was telling my, my family and my husband that, you know, I'm considering this job as a driving evaluator. And they all just started laughing at me. They said, you? You're going to be a driving evaluator? I said, yeah, why not? And so um, they said, don't you need to have a perfect driving record? 
I said, I don't know. And so, because I had a couple of shares of speeding tickets when I first started driving, that's why they were laughing. But I can say um, that it has made me a much better driver by doing this, except for today. <laughs> so um, anyway, I like to keep my presentations fairly informal, so please feel free to answer, to ask me questions as we go, all right? So um, talk a little bit about uh, my facility that I work for. I work for Courage Kenny Rehab Institute. Uh, we started off as Courage Center. Um, we started our program, a driving program, as Courage Center in 1978. Um, I'll, obviously, I wasn't here in 1978 to um, start the driving assessment, but we have uh, a staff member who has been there since 1978, and so he kind of started the program. Um, to where it is now, okay? We merged in 2013 with another rehab institute in the, men, in the Twin Cities area, Sister Kenny, and so now we've expanded to 10 different locations around the Twin City areas. I go to five of those locations at any given day and um, uh, in times of the month. So my biggest fear is to make sure I'm at the right place at the right time um, and not be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, we see over a thousand clients a year, so um, I see about two clients a day, okay, because each of those assessments take about three hours each, okay, and sometimes I might see a driving lesson too. Um, so a thousand clients a year, um, anywhere between new driver to older driver, so sometimes we have, well, lots of times we have parents that bring their son or daughter to see us, to see if that, um, if they had the capability of driving. So even though their son or daughter has never been in a, behind the wheel, you know, we'll take that son or daughter behind the wheel that day and see how they drive, okay? We will obviously do some instruction ahead of time and, um, and see if they improve from start to finish, okay? And that's what we look for, all right? A lot of those new, newer clients that we see tend to be on the autism spectrum. We see a lot of clients uh, have spina bifida, okay, with the hydrocephalus complications and the shunt complications, um, possibly. Um, we also see our share of cerebral palsy or any kind of congenital disabilities or physical disabilities or learning disabilities, um, lots of wide spectrum of newer clients. Um, for our middle age population, we usually see the traumatic injuries, whether it's brain injury or strokes or um, spinal cord injuries, okay, or amputations. Um, the older population, which is the majority of the clients that we see, tend to have Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, we see a lot of progressive diseases as well, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, um, ALS, a wide variety. I've also seen some clients that have had normal pressure hydrocephalus too in the past, okay? Um, our oldest client was 99, believe it or not. So um, I did not have the pleasure of evaluating that person, but my former boss did, and she was, um, after telling the 99-year-old female that she shouldn't drive any longer, um, she responded to, well, can I drive tomorrow then? So um, just kind of a funny little story. So um, what we provide at our facility, we provide comprehensive driving assessments. We also um, look at equipment evaluations for those individuals that are just purely physical disabilities. So someone that has a spinal cord injury or amputation that doesn't have a cognitive component to it. For our comprehensive assessments, we always see um, any individuals that have a cognitive component to their disability, okay, we have to um, see them for a comprehensive, or if someone is 65 or older, we'll see them for a comprehensive assessment. I'll go into more details about that and what that entails later. We also provide vehicle modification evaluations, driving lessons, and extended evaluations, okay? So we are Minnesota Certified Driving School, so we don't provide classroom portion, but we will provide behind the wheel lessons. So if your son or daughter did the classroom portion somewhere else, they, can, um, well, they will just let that agency know that they're gonna take the behind the wheel lessons with us, okay? And we can do that. 
All right, a little bit about our staff. So we have six people on our staff right now, uh, five of which are our occupational therapists. Um, we are all Minnesota licensed driver instructors and we are all certified driving rehab specialists. So what that really means is that we took this national exam um, about um, how, to draw, how to teach people how to drive with certain disabilities and how to assess them with different kinds of adaptive equipment. Um, so that's really what that entails. And we have to get, um, we have to earn a certain amount of continuing education credits every two years to um, maintain that status. Um, and like I said before, we do have one staff member who has been with us since 1978, and he's, although he's not an occupational therapist, he taught us everything we need to know about our driving assessments, and he knows way more than we do. Um, so some of the things I want to get out, I want you to get out of today's uh, presentation is to learn about skills necessary for driving and how they may be altered with a diagnosis of hydrocephalus and when to refer a client for a driving assessment, what's involved in it, okay, what kinds of potential um, adaptive equipment may be available for those with hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus and what happens when the state gets involved, okay. Why is driving so important? Okay, how many of you like driving? Okay, is everybody a driver here or are they kind of thinking about, okay, so some new people, all right. How many people think that driving is a necessity? They don't really particularly like it, yeah. Yeah, so um, I see that more and more with the younger population for some reason. They don't really want to drive, they feel like they have to drive. Their, their mom and dad is making them drive. So one of the first, questions I always ask when someone comes to see me if they're a newer driver or they're thinking about driving, do you want to drive or does mom and dad want you to drive, right? Because you know, I want that person to have their own motivation to do that because if sometimes if they feel like it's a necessity, there's something else going on and why they feel like it's, they're not ready. And so it's trying to figure out um, what's happening with that. So driving is so important because it allows you to socialize, you know, meet family and friends. It allows you to be independent. I hear that a lot when I tell someone that they shouldn't drive. You're taking away my independence. What am I going to do now? You know, that's, that's a hard thing to tell someone they shouldn't drive. Um, they want to feel included in society or they feel like it's a necessity. So. Three main components for driving. You need vision, you need cognition, and you need physical abilities, a certain amount of physical abilities. Um, and it's important to be able to integrate and coordinate all those three systems together to um, increase optimal driving performance. And I'll go into more detail in each category, what that means. So vision, 80% of your driving decisions come from your vision. So as you can imagine, if your vision is not intact or something, part of your vision is not working as well, you can imagine that that's going to really impact your driving, okay? So for example, if someone has trouble being able to see far distances, well, they may not be able to process, oh, that's a, um, the speed limit decreased from 65 to all the way to 45 in a, a certain amount of time, okay? Um, so that's an example of that. So vision allows rapid intake of detailed information. You can use that to adapt to constantly changing environments. You can, it can also help with the speed of that processing of the information and be able to react to the environment. So one of the first things I look at before um, looking at other components for driving, I look at their visual acuity. One of the reasons why I do that is because in every, most states in the United States, they have certain standards for vision to drive, okay? Um, in Minnesota, you need to have at least 2040 of distance acuity to drive. So normal vision is usually 2020, right? Okay? So um, 2040 allows that person to drive within all the different speed limits. However, if they are above 2040, they can still drive up to 2100. Okay, so if they're above 2040, if, if they're between 2040 and 2100, they can drive at speeds less than a freeway. So they can't drive on freeways. 
any longer, okay? But that's gonna differ between, uh, depending on what state you live in. And so um, on the back of your handout, it should have a list of resources you can check, okay? Um, a website that you can check for that, all right? Uh, we kind of look at near vision, but not so much because you use more far vision when you drive, okay? So if I have a client that is 2100 when they come see me, I'm not gonna take them out on the road because it's illegal for them to drive. So before we even get to that point, I always make sure that the schedulers ask the client before they, they um, make an appointment that do they have any visual impairments, okay? And if they have visual impairments, what is their um, acuity level? What is their peripheral vision, okay? Because if they don't meet standards, you know, there's no reason to do the driving assessment at that point. Okay. So the other thing I take a look at is their visual fields. Okay, they have different portions of the visual fields we take a look at. We look at binocular fusion, and that's your ability for your eyes to work together as a unit, the 120 degrees in the middle. And then you have the peripheral limits. Okay, so um, again, in most states around the United States, they have certain peripheral vision standards. In the state of Minnesota, it's um, 105 degrees with both eyes, okay? So you can still be blind in one eye, but as long as you have the central portion of the other eye seen um, in the periphery, as well as the other um, um, intact periphery for the, the functional eye, you'll be able to meet those standards, okay? However, if somebody had a stroke and they had a full visual field cut, they would not qualify. Um, to drive, okay? And then you have the central vision, too, that we check out. So visual processing, the time in which an object is seen, identified, interpreted, allowing decision to be made, and an adaptive response made to the environment. Again, I bring up that example of um, being able to focus, yes, there are a two blocks away, there's a yellow light. I need to start responding, I need to start slowing down, some people, if they're not able to see that as readily, they may take, they may have an abrupt stop, right? Or they may not even see that, that turn red. So um, that's why that visual processing becomes very important to be intact. So some other visual areas that we take a look at is um, can they detect colors? Can they see objects closer than others at depth perception? Can, how are they able to see at night and during bad weather, okay? So death perception, um, great example of that. So I have some clients that may have death perception issues and I see I've had a share of clients that um, with hydrocephalus with a lot of visual issues with that death perception. So some of those clients I um, can see that on the road as not being able to know where to stop you know, before a crosswalk. They're stopping way over the crosswalk or into the intersection. They have a lot of trouble with parallel parking or parking in general, being able to judge space and distance between other cars. Um, being able to change lanes, you know, not really being able to notice how far they are from the other car to safely get over. Okay, I see that a lot. Um, another thing we take a look at is visual perception. So um, how you interpret what you see, okay, and get that accurate understanding of what that interpretation means, being able to organize that information and integrate that with your motor and vestibular skills in a quick manner. Obviously, this gets really important in higher, in, in faster speeds, okay? It's one thing to look at in a clinic where you're, you're sitting down and flipping the pages and timing you, and another um, totally different scenario where you're having to look at that visual perception when someone's going 50 miles an hour, okay? So an example of that is, are they able to notice that um, that's a stop sign coming up ahead, even though it might be partially covered up by a tree branch, okay? Um, in Minnesota, lots of snow, right? Sometimes the snow covers up the lane markings. Can they, can they discriminate that there's still three lanes even though snow might be covering the road, okay? So that's how you perceive things. 
So another big component we take a look at is physical abilities in order to drive, okay? Um, uh, most people in the United States, they mostly drive with just their right foot to go from the gas to the brake, okay? Mostly use their neck, uh, for, so I check for range of motion of the neck to see if they can look, check for blind spots, see if they can look over the shoulder before they back up the car. Um, do they have upper extremity strength and range of motion in order to steer the wheel, okay? Um, are they able to get to the turn signal with their left arm, okay? I'm not saying that you need all those specific skills because certainly we see a lot of clients that don't have all those physical abilities, okay? So we might see a client that um, has right side weakness because of a stroke. So we'll try to see if they can use a left foot gas pedal okay, to drive. Or if someone is paralyzed or they have neuropathy in both feet, I might use hand controls to see if they can drive with that, okay? Or um, someone with spina bifida, someone who um, is shorter, okay, but they can still ambulate, I might use pedal extenders in order for them to operate the gas and the brake. So people can still drive, but I wanna see what their functional abilities, their physical functional abilities are, okay, and try to get them there. So cognition is another big component to, um, for our driving assessments. We need to be able to see if they're able to make judgment and um, good safety to deci safe decisions. Want to see how they're able to problem solve. For somebody that, you know, maybe I ask them, okay, I want you to drive me to the target and find a parking spot, okay? Um, what if they forgot to turn a target? Are they able to make problem solve their way back to target? Okay, I look at that. Um, are they able to organize, organize okay, their information? Are they able to process information in time? Are they able to react in time? Or do they have last minute lane changes or last minute braking or, or um, abrupt starts? Um, memory, you know, I, take, I ask them questions about their memory or, or also their orientation and the date and time, okay? I had this client who was elderly. She had um, Alzheimer's, and um, she forgot how to get home from her daughter's house, and she ended up in three states over the next day, okay? And so, huge, huge component, okay, that we have to take a look at, too. Um, we look at insight. So, um, before I see a client, we always send out surveys to the client and one to the family, same survey. So the surveys can um, ask questions about, do you have any moving violations? Do you have any accidents, okay? Are you not stopping where you need to stop? Are you missing stop signs? Are you not staying in your own lane? Those kinds of things, okay? So sometimes when, I, when they come in to do the assessment, I take a look at the surveys. So this is a good way for me to look at their insight. So sometimes the client surveys look completely different from the family and friends um, surveys. So um, that kind of tells me, well, their insight isn't that great. And then I talk to the family and friend and, okay, tell me the whole story, what's going on, okay? So I've had a client comes in and, you know, usually their daughter recommended they come see us and they're huffing and puffing. They're not happy to see me anyway. So they're saying, I don't know why I'm here. I never had an accident. Nothing's wrong with my driving. You know, I've never had a speeding ticket. I get that a lot. And then um, I look at the, I, I talk to the family member or look at their survey and I'm like, oh yeah, they had five accidents in the last three months, you know, or, or something like that. So it's just, it's really kind of interesting to get that other insight. So. Um, most, well, we always recommend having a family or a friend come with during the assessment so that we have an eyewitness or we have someone else that we can kind of get a good story because we only see that person that day, okay? So sometimes it's good to get a, another picture. Um, we also look at their um, impulsivity tendencies, um, their executive thinking skills, and abstract thinking. So executive thinking skills, sometimes we have these newer drivers who don't have those executive thinking skills very well developed at all. In fact, sometimes we see them on more of the immature side, okay? Um, and so we may recommend, okay, let's 
let's try and assess you two or three years from now. In the meantime, let's work on A, B, and C. You know, let's work on some maybe more therapy, maybe have you go as a um, sit in the passenger seat and be an active passenger where you're commentating or telling your mom and dad where to go and what to look for, look for stop signs, you know, any of that stuff to help them working on those executive skills. Sometimes I even recommend, you know, waiting even after um, high school is over if they go to a transition program where they learn more life skills or if they're working. Sometimes that will also help mature some of those executive thinking skills, okay? And we also take a look at their abstract thinking. So we also assess different types of attention. So we look at selective, divided, and sustained. So selective is being able to prioritize the most important things out there when you're driving and choose and maintain focus on that. But you not only have to do that, you also have to be able to, at the same time, pay attention to multiple things, right? And sustain that attention for a period of time, okay? I've seen clients that um, have some deficits in either one of those or all of them at the same time. So um, uh, sometimes I have a client that's on the autism spectrum that's, um, they have a lot of trouble being, um, being able to multitask and being able to prioritize what's the most important piece of information out there, okay? So sometimes on our driving lessons I'll say, okay, Here's a scenario, you're driving and there is a stoplight that's turning red, or that's turning green, but you also have a car in front of you with the brake lights on, okay? What's, tell me what's the most important thing for you to pay attention to right now. And sometimes I'll say the stoplight, stoplight. I'm like, no, even though that's the green light, you still have to pay attention to the person right in front of you. So going through those scenarios is very important when we're doing lessons. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about this um, because I really want to go into more of the symptoms of hydrocephalus and how that affects driving. But different types of hydrocephalus, they can um, be congenital or acquired after birth. Okay, most of the clients that we do see have spina bifida, okay? And we also see a lot of clients that have the normal pressure hydrocephalus hydrocephalus after birth, okay? Those are the main clients that we see for our driving assessments. Some of the potential symptoms of hydrocephalus can include fatigue or, well these are the, I'm going to just name the ones that are most pertinent for driving. So the fatigue factor, the downward eye deviation, blurred double vision, some balance issues, some poor coordination issues, mobility issues, the dement could be dementia or some mental impairment, could be irritable and seizures. So those are the big things that we really see, you know, s uh, potentially during the driving assessment. Um, so the effects, potential effects on driving depends on what type, if there is a shunt malfunction and severity, okay, of the hydrocephalus. Um, and how we see that is mostly a lot of it's vision, you know, like remember what I was telling you that 80% of your driving decisions come from vision. So as you can see, a lot of the, um, the um, symptoms, a lot of the effects I see are, have to deal with depth perception, ability to have your eyes working as a unit, the binocular fusion that divided attention, that processing speed, reaction time, coordination, height, short-term memory orientation, far vision, and night vision. So I had a client that I saw um, a couple of years ago, and she um, had spina bifida. And one of the things I always ask is when they come in the clinic, I kind of do a mini interview, and I said, okay, what are your experiences? with driving, or, or have you um, ever ridden a bike, have you ever played sports, or have you ever ridden um, a, or driven a golf cart or four-wheeler, and that kind of tells me, gives me a kind of feel for where that person is at at that time. Um, or do you pay attention to when mom and dad's driving, right? And so when I asked this um, client if she paid attention to um, when her parents were driving, she goes, well, I can't see. 
okay? Because she's usually in the back of the van in her wheelchair and she's shorter, so she couldn't see at the windshield. Okay, so that really kind of opened my eyes. I'm like, oh wow, that's, that's true. Yeah, you can't see. How can you be an active passenger or see what's going on when you're driving? So um, she, even though she wasn't a candidate for driving at the time, I recommended that she sit in the front, in the passenger side, and just, and just take a look at the environment while you drive and become an active passenger that way to kind of practice those skills. And then maybe get evaluated in three to, three to four years from now and see if, if some of those um, things have improved, okay? Some of the other possible factors for driving with hydrocephalus, so seizures, okay? Every state is a little bit different in terms of the treatment of seizures and driving. So um, in the state of Minnesota, you need to be three months seizure free before you consider returning back to driving, okay? Um, another possible factor is, you know, if that person needs adaptive equipment because of mobility issues, wheelchair versus ambulatory with an assistive device. So other factors that may affect ability to drive is Maturity level, okay, normal team behaviors, eye contact, social skills, I think I put social reading, I meant social skills, literal interpretations, and anger management, okay? So here's kind of a funny story. Um, I like telling stories about my clients because I have plenty of them. So um, I had a client with autism spectrum and we were at a four-way stop and I was doing a, um, a driving lesson with him. Actually, I think it was an always stop. So we were there and I said, okay, can you tell me the difference between an always stop and a four-way stop? And he says, okay. So at a four-way stop, all four cars have to stop. Okay, when they get there, I'm like, okay, I'll take that. And I said, how about an always stop? He is, well, I think you have to press the brake all the way down. That's what he thought that meant. So that's a um, literal interpretation. So you have to be very, um, uh, you have to kind of, explain a lot about different potential scenarios to a lot of the kids that I see. Because um, especially, uh, especially some kids are very rule oriented, and so they're not able to think outside the box. So you have to um, talk them through potential different scenarios and see, you know, let's talk through this. Tell me what are, what you would do in certain situations, okay? So sometimes if you practice that, with that individual, you will get better responses in that repetition. So some contraindications for driving. So um, obviously seizure, okay, you wanna be seizure free in Minnesota for three months. Some states maybe six months, you know, it depends on where you live. Um, no double vision, you need to make sure you, that is um, um, hopefully improved with maybe prism lenses, okay or if that person has a field cut, if they have a, a full field cut from a stroke, okay, don't, you are not able to drive. Um, if you have nef ne left neglect, again, we see that a lot with people with strokes or um, brain injuries, okay, or poor insight. So another story about a person I saw with left neglect and how that can impact your driving. Um, this um, guy I saw in the clinic, I assessed him and I, already saw that he had left side neglect, but he was very adamant. He's like, I want to drive, I want to drive. I'm like, okay. So I see about 99% of my clients behind the wheel, okay? The only times I don't is they don't meet visual standards or I do not feel safe with them behaviorally, okay? But I saw this guy, I said, okay, I know he's not gonna do that well, but I'm gonna just see how he does. And so we're driving around, okay, doing the behind the wheel portion and every single left turn, we would, when he would turn left, he would always end up on the opposite side of the road or try to go to the opposite side of the road because he just didn't notice that, oh yeah, this is this whole, there's a left side and a right side. So I had to be, re, be able to react in time to get us off of there. So it can be very scary um, depending on the client. So. Who makes referrals to um, our driving assessment facility? So we don't need a doctor's um, referral to do the driving assessment. It's encouraged, but you don't need one, okay? So in fact, we get a lot of referrals from family and friends. So 
family, not sure if mom or dad should still continue to drive. I've seen a lot of accidents with them. Or, you know, maybe my son or daughter. Let's see if they can drive, all right? So we'll get referrals from family and friends that way. Or the client themselves, okay? They might say, you know, I'm getting a little bit older. Let's see where I'm at. Where are my skills at this time? We also get a lot of referrals from other third-party payers, whether it's workers' comp or voc rehab services or the county, okay? So I would um, encourage you to kind of look at your state funding and if um, they will help fund for a driving assessment in your state. Why would you want to do a driving, um, why would you want to go to a driving rehab specialist? Um, because we are more medically based, okay, um, most, most certified driving rehab specialists are occupational therapists, so we have that medical knowledge. Um, we're familiar with different modifications that can be made to cars. We can teach different strategies for um, just driving in general or to use adaptive equipment. We have access to other resources in case someone is recommended no driving, okay. We can give them alternative ways to get to places. Um, we have um, the experience in dealing with driving specific issues between the client and the state. We can assess that client behind the wheel. Okay. All right. So let's go into more comprehensive driving assessments. So the majority of our assessments that we do in our facility are the comprehensives. Okay. Um, three hours for the assessment. It's a long time. The first hour is usually um, dealing with the clinical assessment. So, um, and I'll go into more detail of that, but a lot of our tests that we do in the clinic are standardized, okay, so we can give them values on how they did after and how it compares to normal ranges after um, they've completed the whole assessment. We also do the behind the wheel assessment. Our um, behind the wheel portion isn't just a 15 minute drive, like they take the road test. No, it's not. It's usually 45 minutes to an hour, okay? A lot of people are like, why so long? Well, you know, you're using our car, okay? They have to use our car. We have five different cars that we choose from plus a van. All of our cars have the capability of installing different kinds of equipment, like I mentioned before, the hand controls, left foot gas pedal, spinner knob. So we can do all that. But we have to use our car most importantly because it has a brake on our side. Because I'm not gonna do this job if I don't have that brake. Let me tell you. Um, so we do that behind the wheel assessment. After that, we come back to the clinic, and then I will um, finish typing the report, and then I meet with the family and the client or friends or whatever, um, and then we'll talk about all the results. So they will get a copy of the report that day and find out how they did. And um, let me kind of steer back. So um, before we even start the clinical, I always tell the client what are the possible outcomes. Because I don't want them to have any surprises after we get done. Because I tell them, okay, um, after we get done, those possible recommendations can either be that you are safe to drive without restrictions, or you may need restrictions to drive, okay? And I'll go into more detail about that. Or you need to retire from driving because of safety reasons, or um, you may need driving lessons. Okay. So the clinical portion of our driving assessment, um, we do a lot of history, a lot of talking to kind of get a feel for why they're there to see me, okay? Um, looking at their driving history, looking at the surveys that I mentioned, um, how their medications cannot possibly impact driving, okay? Are they on any narcotics, okay? How are they getting around right now? How are they driving, you know? Or do they restrict themselves to certain areas, okay? Um, Physical status, you know, are they having some weakness on one so side of the body and the other, would they possibly need adaptive equipment? Taking a look at their vision, their visual motor skills, reaction time, as well as their cognition. Behind the wheel portion. So, um, like I said, I take almost all my clients out. Because if I don't, and I tell them that they shouldn't drive, they're going to tell me, well, you didn't even take me driving, how can you know? That's why we take a lot of our clients out, no matter what, except if they don't reach the visual standards. We go on a, a certain route, because I want to see how they deal with some residential areas, some um, parking lots, some busier parking lots. A lot of my clients are like, well, I only go to church, I only go to the grocery store. Well, I want to see them in that, okay? That's where most accidents happen, 
is in parking lots, okay? So um, I also want to see how they do some left and right turns, some with lights or without lights, some lane changes, some freeway driving, if that's in their repertoire. So um, I always ask the client where they drive before we go out, because I'm not going to take someone that doesn't go on the freeway any longer, I'm not going to take them on the freeway. Or if they live in rural Minnesota, I'm not going to take them in downtown Minnesota, right? In downtown Minneapolis, I mean. So, you know, you got to kind of be functional to where that person is driving at that time. And be fair to that person. Sometimes, you know, if I can't really see what I want to see at the time of the eval, I might recommend an extended evaluation. So I might schedule another time to actually go to their house, do a lesson. Okay, I'll say, I want you to take me to your places that you usually go. Okay? I don't do that with everybody, but if some if it's someone I was just kind of hairy about, then I, I will do that additional lesson and then give them the recommendations after that, okay? But some of the things that we look for is, are they able to control the vehicle? How are their turns? Is it too wide? Are they, are they ending up on the, on the opposite side of the lane of the road, you know? Are they making too sharper turns where they hit the curb each time, right? Um, can they maintain lane position or are they kind of weaving in and out all the time? Okay. Are they able to plan and process if I tell them, okay, we're going to take a right at the next block and then make your second left-hand turn. Are they planning ahead for that? Right? Do they know that they have to change lanes to get in that turn lane? Sometimes I have a person that will wait till the very last minute to get over. And so I have to be ready for that. Are they able to um, identify possible risk situations? Um, example, are they... Um, are they looking over their shoulder before they merge onto the freeway, or are they just kind of looking um, forward gaze? Okay, so do they have good judgment? Okay, are they able to control the speed? I had a client that drove about 20 miles an hour the entire 45 minutes. Okay, actually it took an hour at that time, but um, it was just a long drive. Are they able to see the signs in time? You know, can they identify school zones, especially with a blinking yellow light? Are they able to scan and pay attention to multiple things? I have several clients that can't pay attention or don't even notice that they have a rear view mirror. You know, everything's here. Um, are they able to uh, manage distractors? Or are they able to use adaptive equipment? So some of the non-prescriptive equipment that we may recommend are mirrors, okay, for maybe those of people that don't have full neck range of motion might um, recommend panoramic mirrors or blind spot mirrors or even um, backing up cameras, okay? Um, most newer cars have that capability. In fact, a, a lot of newer cars have a lot of safety features now that help you change lanes and, um, well, and then they have the self-driving cars, but we won't even go there. Um, but they also have pad padded steering wheels that we can prescribe for people that have arthritis as well as adaptive key holders, cushions for individuals that are a little shorter. Okay, and then seat belt extenders for clients that are a little bit larger. Here are some pictures of um, some potential recommendations we might give to clients. So they have different types of vans with the rear entry, the side entry. They have six-way power seats, which is um, really helpful. Where's my pointer here? I don't know where it is. Um, and that's helpful for clients that want to actually transfer into the driver's seat so that they can move the chair so that they can um, make that transfer a lot easier. As well as the other um, uh, chair in the middle, on the bottom middle part, um, that allows the chair to come down and again they can transfer from the chair to the, to the um, driver's side, although that's the passenger side at that point. Um, but that's helpful too. But you also have to consider the environment where they live, because obviously in Minnesota may not be the best option because you don't want to be out there at negative 20 um, transferring unless you have a garage. Um, you also have the ability, you may be able to drive from your wheelchair too, so that's another possibility. Some other considerations. I wish I had this pointer. Oh, there it is. So um, hand controls. So this is a hand control where the left foot, the left hand is doing the gas and brake 
and the right hand is steering the wheel, okay? You can interchange these, you know, where the right hand's doing this gas and brake over here and the left hand's doing the, um, the steering. Um, but most of the times we have it on the left side because the console gets in the way. Um, this is a, a good, I don't, I'm always losing this thing, um, pedal extenders, okay? So these are for clients that might be on the shorter side, okay? A lot of spina bifida, okay? that I might see that I might recommend these pedal extenders. Because as you can see, this is the regular brake, okay? So this extends out, okay? And then the gas pedal over there. So with pedal extenders, I usually recommend having the left foot doing the brake and the right foot doing the gas, okay? Um, and then you also have the ability to, to drive from the ch wheelchair, all right? So obviously, if we're gonna recommend adaptive equipment, it's not gonna be just, you know, one one assessment and you're here you go, right? So it's gonna entail a lot of driving lessons uh, and making sure that that person has the cognitive components in order to operate that adaptive piece of adaptive equipment. And here's some more. So again, this is the inside part of the van where, I cannot find this laser, um, where you can drive from the wheelchair into the, um, from the driver's seat. And then another picture of the chair coming down. And then this picture on the right is an easy lock. And so if somebody's driving from their wheelchair, they can just drive up to the, in front of the steering column and it'll lock your wheelchair in place. So that's kind of a nice feature. So um, there, there are different types of adaptive equipment that we'll take a look um, to use for certain types of clients depending on the level of disability. But whenever you're driving in Minnesota with an um, adaptive piece of equipment, you have to take the state road test, okay? So that's a legal um, restriction. So if that person is using hand controls, they have to pass a road test like you did when you were 16 with that hand control, all right? So we do recommend a lot of lessons, all right? And usually the last two lessons, we will actually take our clients to the um, road test and they can use our car to perform the, um, the road test with our car using that equipment. So that's kind of helpful. Um, we also, um, if someone's using electronic controls, a left foot gas pedal, pedal extenders, a spinner knob, I didn't put that in there, and prosthetics used in driving. So um, after the drive, um, got possible outcomes. I kind of already mentioned this before. So those possible outcomes can either be that you continue to drive without any restrictions, or you may need restrictions like no freeway, no rush hour, daytime only, or within a certain mile radius from home, okay? Those are the legal restrictions in Minnesota. Other states may be a little bit different, but that's how it is here. Um, and also, before I make those restrictions, I also have to consider that client's cognitive ability to adhere to those restrictions, okay? Um, some of the other things I might recommend, especially if someone has Alzheimer's or dementia, because I know it's probably gonna be progressive, I might say, yes, you can be restricted to this area right now, in familiar areas, but you may not need to come back and see me to do another reassessment in the future, okay? So it all depends on the, um, the disability or the reason why they're seeing me, okay? Um, I might also recommend lessons, um, and then also more lessons if they're using adaptive equipment. The other option is, or not option, other outcome is no driving, okay? That's where I'm not the good guy anymore. So, um, in fact, a lot of clients' um, families bring their client to see me because they want us to be the bad guy because they don't want to tell their parent or their loved one or their son or daughter that they shouldn't drive, okay? So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a hard part of, my, um, of, of what I do because I have to, you know, make sure I tell them kind of bluntly that these, these are the reasons why it's not safe for you to drive. 
And of course, it is it is hard to get that information, but I have to keep telling myself I'm doing um, I'm doing this to make sure that they're safe and that others are safe on the road. Okay. Um, if it is recommended no driving, I give them a list of resources, whether it's um, how to get their medications delivered or groceries delivered or different support groups out there. I also give them a different list of other ways of getting around. Okay, I ask them, you know, what county you lived, live in, and then I give them alternative ways of getting around in that county. Um, I may also recommend more therapy. You know, if somebody came to see me, um, and they're having trouble coordinating their physical abilities, you know, especially with turns as well as their vision, okay? I might recommend some vision therapy. I might recommend some occupational therapy to work on some divided attention and processing speed. And then maybe come back and see me later, right? Because it might be too soon. Um, or a reavow in the future, especially for those progressive diseases, okay, like multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's dementia. Um, I tend to reassess those individuals um, on a yearly basis, okay? So um, it's important for um, doctors to report, okay, if they feel like their, their um, client, if they have some red flags, okay? So that's mainly just saying that it's their responsibility to report for the public safety. Um, also, other people that can um, prompt a driving assessment will be could be policemen if they pulled over that client okay and they saw that they had some issues with driving or they had an accident or an employee at the DMV you know when that person came in to renew their license and they saw some red flags you know whether it's their vision or um, just acting a little funny so they might um, report to the state um, as well as physicians if they see any red flags again with their patients they might report or they may recommend a driving assessment and families okay anyone can really report yes ma'am Um, I haven't needed to do that right now because most of the um, individuals that I see, are you talking about clients that already have seen me or just clients that I see on the road that might? Well, I'm just curious. You're, you've indicated that you know you take people out and you do an assessment yes. on them. So if I brought in my elderly parent mm -hmm. and you determine that they probably shouldn't be driving. Right. Are you obligated then, and do you notify DMV that my father or mother should no longer be driving? Very and likewise, good. if I bring in my son who's looking mm -hmm. to get an assessment on whether or not he should drive, and you decide no, do you report that then, and he'll never get a driver's license? Good question. Very good question. So usually before we get started, um, we always encourage clients, you know, I ask them, how did, how did you get referred to see me? Most of the times it's doctors, okay, and I usually try to get authorization to send the report to the doctor, and that's how it's reported. We cannot um, just report directly to the state, okay, after these assessments are done. It has to be, legally, we have to go through the doctor and the doctor report to the state or the family can report to the state if they if the client did not allow us to get that authorization okay most of the times if the doctors referred them to see us they usually will um, agree with our recommendations okay um, lots of times if it's a son or daughter and the parents just take them to see us they usually say, well, this is just for our purposes right now, and you know they would adhere to those um, recommendations amongst themselves, okay? But I, I will not report to the state and said, no, this person is never gonna get a license again, no. Yes, sir. I'm not aware of a United States of a psychologist in the of an MD neurologist who has prepared letters Mm-hmm. 
So if I'm hearing you right, you um, had mentioned that you're aware of um, a doctor who's written letters that that, that his a, a medical statement that his um, patient had normal pressure hydrocephalus. Yes. And then from there, did he recommend drive, no driving, or um, what was the purpose in that letter, I guess? Okay, so um, if, if it was a new diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus, you know, you can, you can have different symptoms from that, right? You, can, you might have the dementia component or some mental impairments as well as the defy attention processing speed and all the other stuff. I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes a person gets confused when stopped by the police. Well, I It can definitely affect your performance for driving a normal pressure hydrocephalus. And that's why sometimes the doctors recommend that that person come see us to see if this is kind of an ongoing thing. Um, uh, sometimes. Right. Right, right. So Good point. Safe, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. I understand what you're saying now. So yes, um, there are definitely some coordination issues that could possibly an effect from the normal pressure hydrocephalus. And maybe that's the reason why the doctor maybe wrote a statement so that a person can always have that in the car with them or, or saying that he has a, a diagnosis of this, of, of this and this is how it, you may have symptoms of A, B, and C because of that. Um, and sometimes that person might get a letter from the state saying they need a doctor's statement in order to do a driving assessment. So that's when they come see us and then if we recommend restrictions, then we'll... Ball yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm a medical alert member, and I have medical alert on my ID, my driver's license. It has a big M, and um, I have a medical alert card that I would show the officer, and it would state any kind of, you know, um, I have hydro, if I'm on meds or whatever. Um, and I wonder if that would mm -hmm. help because um, when you go to your DMV, yes. um, on the DMV, you know, you can suggest you would like to be a donor. And then I, I don't know where I got it. I'm sure it was the DMV, but it has a big M on it for a med medical or I'm with their association or whatever you call it. They have all my records and whatnot. Well, I've had it for years. Well, medical alert is uh, nationwide. Yeah, when you, in Minnesota, if you go to the DMV and renew your license, they might have a little statement that says, have you had uh, a new medical diagnosis? And if people put yes on it, then that will flag the state and they may have to do a driving assessment. And then, um, and then that's where maybe some of the restrictions or maybe having a card like a medical alert card with you in a car that says, okay, these are, uh, 
you know, I might have some trouble with coordination skills or, you know, these are the restrictions of where I can drive. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah, that'll be good. And another option that was, there's a. officer might say, you know what, um, I think I might have some concerns about his ability to drive and that might, he might report that to the state and they may recommend that you do a driving assessment. Yeah, so that so how that kind of comes in play. Right, right. But if he, if he notices some other issues, he may point that out. So, um, okay. So again, this kind of talks about what you were talking about, some red flags, okay? If there are any neuro, at, at the time, if you're renewing your license, and if the person at the DMV notice, or they have questions about you know, any medical changes that we just talked about, you may have to answer question, questions about your recent hospitalization or any neurological changes. Or if, you're, if you can't pass the vision part, that might flag them too. If you're, Yep, if you're applying for a handicap license, that might flag them because, oh, there's something different about this. Or if family and friends may notice some driving issues. Okay. Now, I know you had a question in the back. No? Okay. And so when the state becomes involved, so you may get a letter from the state that asks you to do a couple of things. Um, you might have to go for an interview. Okay, and they'll ask you questions about, you know, what has changed in your medical condition or what's, why are you here? Um, you might have to get a physician statement. Usually if you need a physician statement, they don't feel like they have the expertise to judge driving, so that's why they recommend that you see us, okay? That's how we get into the loop. Um, they, you might have to go to a eye doctor to get uh, an eye report to make sure that you're passing all the, um, the visual standards for driving. You may have to retake the written test as well as the, the regular state road test on top of our comprehensive assessment. So that's where it gets really hairy. So they, even though they may have passed our comprehensive, they still have to take the state road test. And if they take that state road test and they fail, they are on the high art, they are the highest part of that hierarchy, so they will cancel the license even though they may pass us, but they don't pass the state road test. So it's kind of interesting, but most of the times we kind of um, concur with each other. Okay, so this is how to refer a client, okay, if you're in the state of Minnesota, that is, or if you're from another state that don't have driving rehab specialist, you can always come back over. And I have the numbers there. Um, we have several different locations, okay, that we see our clients. 
And if you have any questions, my email is down there as well as my phone number. So you can always ask me questions and I can be able to answer them hopefully. Yes. Okay, say they go through all this, you know, they were re referred. Mm -hmm. They come to Sister Kenny, they get, um, you know, evaluated. Uh, everything's good. You know, um, you pass all the tests. Mm -hmm. At the very end then, how do they get a certification saying, yep, you're good to drive, or you get a little sticker with a happy face, or you put it on your windshield, or how would you ever prove, yep, yep I'm good to go? Yep. So you get a copy of the report. I gave you a copy of the report. Carry it with you? Um, you can, or, or sometimes I recommend just putting it in your glove compartment, you know? Um, you don't have to carry it with you. Sometimes if you share it with your daughter, it'll be in your record. You know, that you took this and you passed it. So, um, usually... He's your family. Yes, and yourself, that you're okay at this point, yeah. Okay. Okay. Because, you know, if, if something changes in your life and you have a new medical condition and you're just not really um, sure about your driving, do this driving assessment. You know, it, it, even though it is a cost, and I'll go over that in a few minutes because it's a private um, funding type of thing, it's, it's worth the liability issues later on if you do get into a lot of accidents. Okay? So... Um, I'll get this question all the time. Is our driving assessments covered under insurance? No, it's not because health insurance doesn't think driving is a medical necessity. So therefore they don't pay for it. So our driving assessments is $402. We do offer AAA or AARP discounts of so $20 off of that. Sometimes workers comp will pay for it or other third party payers. Um, if you are a medical assistant through the state, you automatically qualify for a discounted rate, okay? So there are other options out there, okay? Any other questions? Just our state, yeah, I'm just talking about Minnesota, okay? There are other driving assessment places besides Courage Kenny in Minnesota, so we're not the only ones. So obviously there's freedom of choice. You don't have to go through just us, okay? Any other questions? Okay. Well, I know this is the last session of the day, so enjoy the rest of your night, and thank you for your attention.